This is going to be a brief kind of rambly discussion of some of my thoughts about my career path and social media and community and how all those things tie together. So let's back up. I'm Lucy. That's my name. Um, I'm a cartoonist, right? Uh, I draw comic books. It's pretty fun. I am also a tall ship sailor. I work on enormous sailing vessels at sea, most of them styled after ships in the 1800s. And I kind of toggle between both of those careers, but most of the time I am impersonating a velociraptor of some sort. <laughs> so that's the picture that we're going to go with for now. Um, a couple things about me. I make comics for a living full time. I live in Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest in the US. And I've forgotten everything that I've written down, so I'm just going to read it off. Um, most of my comics are about nonfiction stuff, a lot of autobiographical content, some essays, some travelogues. It's a lot of things to do with real life adventures that I go on and then translate into visual stuff for other people to consume. And the goal there is generally, I'll talk about this a little bit more down the line, but half to do with giving people experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. So I've done a couple of rafting trips through the Grand Canyon and like big whitewater rafts. And I make comics about that because the Grand Canyon is a pretty limited access place, right? And a lot of folks aren't gonna be able to get down there. So being able to give people comics that give them that experience is great. The comics that I make about tall ship sailing, I'm actually designing as kind of a gateway drug. I would like people to read them and then go become tall ship sailors. <laughs> or cartoonists, really, it's not, or velociraptors, right? And I'm not, uh, live your life, do what you wanna do, it's fine. But I feel like comics can, can serve these two different purposes of either challenging you to do something different with your life. And when I say comics, because I know we have a mixed batch of people from uh, graphic storytelling and other departments, which is great, uh, assume that I'm talking about all creative storytelling media, right? I work at a Periscope studio, which is the largest collective of freelance comic book artists in North America. I believe there's about 28 of us. We all share a big studio in Portland. Feels very much like what you guys have going on here, which I'm very envious of, and I wish I could stay longer than two weeks. I self-publish all my work. I'm an independent creator. I do have an agent now, and I'm starting to work on a full-length graphic novel that will be more traditionally published. But for the most part, I put my stuff up online for free, and I crowdsource finances to publish my books through Kickstarter and also through Patreon. Hands up, everyone knows about Kickstarter, right? How many people have heard of Patreon before? My class, I know you have. Okay, cool, I don't have to explain what that is, easy. Uh, my finances, because that's always a part of being a freelance creator, are mostly done through selling books that I've self-published, going to conventions, freelance illustration gigs, and Patreon is taking on more and more of the brunt of paying my bills, which I love. I used to loathe the very notion of social media. And now I think it's really great. I was one of those kids who insisted on not getting a cell phone until I was like, I don't know, 18. I was just like, no, I don't want to be reachable. And as my students can attest now, I am a, a social media evangelist because I think as an independent creator, it's the thing that has allowed me to make my career sustainable. I would not have been able to do what I do for a living with the degree of independence that I do without the web. So I'm going to hopefully prod some of you who are not my students who I've already berated about this nonstop into <laughs> perhaps creating a social media profile or starting to put your work online because I think you're all doing really amazing work here and the internet can benefit from it. And I spend a lot of time thinking about communities. I am parts of lots of them in Portland, my community at Periscope, my social community, the comics people that I've befriended at conventions, my sort of online comics community. And I also think about it in terms of sailing, right, in terms of crews and shipmates and how we bolster each other through our strengths to become better creators and to become more sustainably situated in our lives. And I really love boats. I just, <laughs> gosh, um, they're great. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, so for now, here's a mess of some work that I've done. These are some samples of pages from various books. Uh, a couple of these are, this is like a Grand Canyon travelogue. This is some fictional work for a series called Cartosia Tales. There's a couple pages from my sailing comics, which I just kickstarted a big collection that's going to be coming out hopefully this summer, God willing. Uh, and a little essay about social dancing, uh, swing dancing and blues dancing, and what it's done for me. So that's kind of what my work looks like. I realized I neglected to show my students anything that I'd done <laughs> on day one. Sorry guys, this is boring. You've seen this part already. So this is the, the really brief timeline of my career, which was really fun to try and map out. I basically started getting serious about comics around 2009, and I was at university, not for art, just at a liberal arts college from 2009 to mid-2012, or mid, yeah. And basically, a couple key things happened along the way. I got converted to comics by going to a workshop rather like 
the stuff that you're teaching here uh, at a place called the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont, which is a graduate program just for comics. It's a very, very small school. Like if you had, you know, graphic storytelling and just compressed that into a tiny rural town. So I went to a two week workshop or a, no, not a two week workshop, like a five day workshop. It was very brief, but I cranked out my first mini comic. I was totally hooked. It was the first time, like for many of you, I'd imagine that I was in a place with lots of other people who were also passionate about making comics. And I wasn't just the odd duck out who, you know, was into drawing, but didn't have anyone to bounce ideas off of. And then when I got back to Portland, I immediately enrolled in a sort of low residency certificate program in comics and independent publishing at a place in Portland called the Independent Publishing Resource Center, which was kind of intended to keep the community going. I started meeting more people in the Portland comic scene. I started gearing myself up to apply for an internship at Periscope, which I was really hoping to do because I'd been in love with one of the creators who worked there platonically, not in a creepy way, definitely, <laughs> for... I don't know, three or four years at that point. I've been reading her work for a long time and she spoke of it very highly. And so I thought, oh, I want to go there. I want to go there. But I couldn't work up the courage to send in my application. So I stalled and stalled and stalled. And then my senior year, I ended up doing a capstone project that was like a comic book and it was 36 pages. I really wanted to publish it. The department was not going to pay for me to publish it. So I thought I'd do this crazy thing called Kickstarter. And I went and put up a little campaign where I was trying to raise $1,200 to do a modest print run, that felt like millions of dollars. It might as well have been a million. But the campaign did super well, and it ran for the last three weeks of my undergraduate career and ended 700% funded at $11,700, which was great for all my snooty art professors who had been like, mm, we don't do commercial art. This doesn't really strike us as practical. And when I was able to quote to them during my thesis defense how much money I'd raised, I got a really great double take out of the snootiest professor. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. It felt really good, you guys. Um, <laughs> so then, uh, more things continued happening, and I'll show you, uh, I'm going to overlay a couple other timelines on top of this so you can see what's driving these changes, because I think a lot of the time people look at their career paths. I imagine a lot of the talks that you guys get are very driven by, then I did this, then I got this internship, then I'm working in this job, and now my life is perfect. Hooray. And I think we don't look at the overlying factors a lot of the time, like what really goes into that. So I joined Periscope as an intern after applying. And then I became a full-time member about a year later after being an intern for a bit and then a studio assistant. And then I ran a second Kickstarter three years after my first one, having been on social media this whole time, having been plugging my comics and making new work. And that campaign, as you can see, did considerably better than the first one, which is really exciting. I can't believe that I've raised that much money. Um, Obviously, it's Kickstarter, so a lot of that money goes away. But the stuff that the number that is there, I find very exciting and impressive. Uh, really quick, here are the timelines for when I joined various social media platforms relative to my career. So I got on Twitter way at the very beginning. I got a WordPress blog and started an actual portfolio site for myself about a year after that. Then I made a professional Facebook page begrudgingly the year after that. So nobody really likes Facebook. I got on Instagram in 2012. I did take a hiatus for like a year, but then I got back to it. I joined Tumblr shortly thereafter that. And then I finally started publishing comics on Medium, which is a publishing platform. And I'll run down later in the talk, there's gonna be a whole slide of all the different places that you should consider making a profile online. Add to that the number of conventions I was doing each year as I was publishing new comics. So I'm just trying to get, give you guys a sense of like how much I was putting out there in relation to where my career was at. So for each milestone, I think there's a, a relevant number that you can look at for like, oh, a certain number of people would have seen my work on Twitter at that point, or a certain number of people would have met me at a convention. When I started out in 2011, I did one itty bitty local zine symposium festival. The second year I did one itty bitty zine symposium and I went to a big show with Periscope. The next year I did six conventions. The next year I did nine conventions. Like it, it scales, right? The more experience you have, and then I dropped back down to six because I had a year when I was making a bunch of stuff and I didn't have as much time to travel. And then uh, moving forward, I have no idea. This year is probably gonna be nuts considering that I'm starting it in Denmark. <laughs> yeah, Denmark, so cool. I love my job. Uh, so at each one of those conventions, right, you are connecting people to your social media. You're giving them that human connection. And I think just looking at it in terms of online followers is a little detrimental and we'll get into why that is down the line but having a, an entire social cohesive group that's not only online but is also in person and i think that's why the school is amazing here because you have that with each other right here you don't have to go out and cobble these people 
together from various social circles, you kind of have it built in. So I would say take advantage of that and also start putting yourself online because you can, as my students have been seeing over the last couple of weeks, bolster each other and gain more followers by being part of a group. Um, this is what my boat looks like. I love my boat. <laughs> she doesn't belong to me, but I crew on this boat. This is the Lady Washington. She's a replica of a 1790s US built trading ship. Uh, she was built in Boston and sailed around Cape Horn to the Pacific Northwest and engaged in a bunch of trading stuff. That doesn't really have anything to do with what we're talking about, so we'll move on. But here are some things that are true about sailing, which are also true about art, it turns out. It can definitely feel like the best job in the world. Hopefully all of you will graduate and you will start working in your chosen creative fields and people will be like, oh, you're a cartoonist slash animator slash modeler, that must be the best. You're living your dream, you're following your passion. And some days it does feel like that, right? Other days, it's really fucking hard. It's super fucking hard. Attesting to all the people who are not here right now because they're crunching on their deadlines for their classes. It's like puking your guts out, right, because you're seasick, then climbing 27 meters aloft, furling a sail that weighs many, many, many more times than you do with a team full of people in the driving rain, having to climb down and haul on all these lines until your hands are bleeding. And that's what comics feels like sometimes. It's also what sailing feels like sometimes. And I think a lot of people would say, oh, you're a tall ship sailor. The romance of the ocean, that must be so great. And all I can think about is how I am puking all the time. Like, <laughs> just constantly vomiting everywhere. Always vomit away from the wind. This is like, if you learn anything from this talk, forget everything about comics. Just puke, puke into the wind. Don't puke and have it come back. <laughs> Terrible thing. The sea is a harsh mistress. This is something that you have to come to grips with when you work on a tall ship, is that there are seasons and weather patterns and currents and tides that are going to take your boat places that you may not want it to go. And sometimes you can fight against that and you can haul so hard and furl so hard and puke so hard that the boat does go where you want it to go. And other times you just can't and you have to roll with the punches. And I think that's a really valuable metaphor for the way that we approach our creative practice because especially in school, I see this attitude of like, self-flagellating, you know, I have to stay up for three days straight and like never sleep or eat or do anything nice for myself in order to get this job done, and that's not sustainable. It's not good for you. So sometimes it's valid to say, wow, I am hella distracted today. I cannot focus on one thing. I'm struggling to maintain momentum on this project. What if instead of just punching myself over how I'm not getting work done the way that I should be, I give myself permission to take a morning and like refocus and re-energize and be good to myself? Or you take an afternoon to sail 200 miles off course and then deal with that issue later. <laughs> it also takes enormous courage. Climbing aloft, going up into the rigging, scrambling up there when the ship is pitching back and forth and the wind is blowing and the swirl is going and blah, 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 blah. It's all very dramatic. And I think we don't always talk about how as storytellers, you're being asked to put part of yourselves on the line. Every time you commit something that you really care about to paper, you're putting your passion into that, hopefully, right? Don't half-ass it, please. But if you make something that's really you, that's like taking a chunk of yourself and putting it out there in the world. And that's a really, really scary thing to do. So I think it's valid to give yourself some credit for the courage that is required. That being said, the ship is nothing without her crew. And I think that you as creators are going to be, if not nothing, severely scuppered by the lack of a, sol a solid community of people who are going to support you in your plans and dreams. Speaking of which, here are some of my crewmates from various times. Here's me, here's me again. There's me in the red shirt. And these are people who I all love dearly, who I've entrusted my life to in various contexts, and we have done some sketchy shit together. Uh, and they're great, but that's enough about sailing. Here is a crew of different people. These are the first year graphic storytelling students, <laughs> who I also love dearly, who I've spent a really wonderful two weeks with. And I bring up these two pictures right next to each other <laughs> because they don't look that different, really. These guys look a little bit more barbarous. I would actually not like to meet them in, d in a dark alley. <laughs> but yeah, especially Samal. I don't know what he's got on his head, but it's like, I'm not into it. I think, I think it's a spider. A spider, all right, solid. Come in, you guys, come in. So uh, yeah, I, I think this point that I'm making about you guys having an ingrained community here at the school, this is a great thing because you can practice. You can start posting on social media and rather than shouting into the vacuumous void, you can have your classmates fave your stuff and retweet you and like your posts and tumble them and whatever else people do on social media. And uh, that's a pretty neat thing. It kind of creates a safe space for you to start to spread your wings in that context and not feel 
entirely alone trying to gain an audience. You have an audience. And what's more, you have an audience of people who are around you, who have seen you struggle, who have stayed up all night with you in the studio. And that is such a great thing to be able to draw from. So here's the deal with social media. I know this is what you're all really here for, right? The nitty gritty. There's this kind of harsh quote from Austin Kleon in his book, uh, Show Your Work, which is a really great read. He's also written a book called Steal Like an Artist, which I would highly recommend. And he says, in this day and age, if your work isn't online, it does not exist. It does exist, right, in a certain sense of the word. But as my students have heard me say over and over this week, people cannot give you money if they don't know who you are. They cannot pay you if they don't know you exist. They cannot hire you for things if they have never heard of you before. And I think the way that we form those communities, those crews of people, is by showing up on each other's radars over and over again, right? There are lots of people in, in my life, creators that I follow, whose work I have never read, but they get retweeted into my timeline enough times, and every time they're retweeted, I see something that I like, and I think, oh, that's great, I should follow them. And then maybe I find out that they make comics about uh, salamanders. This happened to me recently. <laughs> It's a big world out there. People make comics about all kinds of things. Uh, and the next time an editor comes to you, because along the course of the way you've made friends with some editors, and says, hey, we're launching a line of science comics about animals. Do you know anybody? And you guys all know that feeling when you can recommend a friend for a job, or you can like make a connection. Maybe it's just me. I really get off on this. I think it's like very satisfying as a human being to put people together and say, oh, you're looking for this kind of person, and you're looking for this kind of person. I'm shit at it romantically. Please don't come to me with your romantic questions. But uh, as far as work goes, it's great. I stack my interests very clearly in that department. So I, I think there's a lot to be said for being visible, because if your work doesn't exist online, it's harder to make those kinds of crazy, far-reaching connections. And I am only here in Denmark, I've done a lot of reflecting about this this week, and I, I named this talk The View from Aloft, because like when you climb up a loft on the tall ship, and you're up there on the yard looking down, it's, it's a long way down, and you get a lot of perspective. And I think teaching for the last few weeks, this is the first time I've done a long form teaching thing. And it's been very interesting to see all the ways in which the educators who have touched me throughout my life are coming through in my teaching. And what I've actually picked up in the last six years of doing this full time, so, I don't know where I was going with that. I think I brought it up because I'm, I'm having feelings about the whole, the whole experience. Uh, but, I, but I want people to be online because I think that creates a community that is going to drive all of us forward. And that's the lame ending that I'm going to put on that sentence that I forgot the start of. Shoot. Whatever that point was. So, this is the nitty gritty business, right? Get out your smartphones, take a picture of this if you're um, super overwhelmed. I should point out that that thing where I showed you guys, like, oh, I joined, you know, this network in this year and this network in that year. And it was, like, pretty lenient, kind of stroll through the park, ambly, rambly thing. Uh, all of my students, I have asked them to make all of these in the last, like, three days. And they've done a stellar job. They are uh, rock stars, a lot of them. But keep in mind that you don't have to go whole hog and, like, sign up for everything at once and have it be this huge thing. You can take it slow. But this is kind of the rundown. Twitter, Tumblr, Medium, Instagram. About.me has a really nice service where you can just plug in all of your social media links, and then it creates a nice little landing page. So when people Google you or you put it in your email signature, it'll take people to a page and they can find you everywhere online. As I have hammered home in class time and time again this week, people on the internet are lazy and stupid. You should treat them with respect. You should always treat your audience with respect. But when all of us browse the internet, something happens and we become lazy and stupid. And if a website takes more than three seconds to load, or if we go to somebody's page and it takes us more than a minute to find their contact information, less than a minute, 30 seconds tops, then they don't get that job, right? Because we get distracted and we're like, oh. I have had to tweet at people angrily before because I have wanted to hire them for jobs based on their amazing work on Tumblr. And there is no way on God's green earth to contact them through Tumblr, aside from Tumblr mail. And I'm, I have limits. I'm not going to Tumblr mail anybody and offer them a job. So have your email address out there, everywhere. This should be a no-brainer, but it's not. So OK, what is at the heart of social media, though? Right? I've been harping on this. People. People are at the heart of social, social, social media. And we all kind of want the same things as people. We're all fucking terrified right, of everything, constantly. <laughs> I'm quaking in my boots right now. <laughs> I'm sure all of you are worried about your deadlines or whatever. Um, so. The things that make us scared, but we can get over it by having each other and holding hands. Everybody hold hands. Uh, we're all going to sing Kumbaya now. It's going to be great. Um, but like remembering that on the other side of the computer are human beings. And I think that's what is 
valuable, something we've come across in class this week is I've been telling my students to reach out to creators they admire on Twitter and just drop them a line and say, hey, we were reading your comic in class today. Really enjoyed it. I had a student take a photograph of a webcomic that we were analyzing and tweet it to both of the creators. And within seconds, they had written back saying, oh my god, I can't believe you're teaching my comic in a class. That's so cool. And we forget because we read this work and we think, oh, wow, so professional, much art, very wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that was a hip children joke. Uh, I'm a hip child. It's cool. I can make those jokes. I know memes. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's like, it's, it distances us, right? We look at people through the lens of the internet and we forget that they are people. We see them as geniuses. And what's great about Twitter is it's the great equalizer. You hop on there, Twitter is kind of my favorite social media medium, and you've got artists who you admire and respect an insane amount. Some of them are spouting off really like bigoted racist nonsense and then you're like, ooh, okay, maybe gonna reassess how I treat this person and their work. But other people will say things like, ah, I'm really frustrated about this panel tonight. I'm just having a hard time drawing hands. And we've all been there, right? <laughs> drawing hands is hard. But if the person in question is somebody who you look up to and you're like, oh my god, this person's hands are perfect, seeing them struggle should be incredibly depressing because you're like, oh no, if this person struggles with hands, like I'm never going to feel good about the way I draw hands. I'm going to be sad and miserable and alone forever. But it doesn't do that for some reason. It makes you feel like we're all in this together. We're all people struggling to figure out how the fuck to draw hands. <laughs> how do they work? I don't, it's difficult. <laughs> so here are some things about <laughs> being a person on the internet that I have done my best to distill down. And my approach to social media, I have friends say like, oh, Lucy, I really enjoy your presence on social media. It's very like peppy and upbeat and fun. And when I was coming to teach this class, I was struggling to kind of condense and figure out how I would teach that, because a lot of it is just like, I have no shame, blah, here's me on the internet, with some limits, right, and some healthy, some healthy boundaries. Uh, so in writing the syllabus for the class, I was kind of struggling to figure out, like, what would I boil this down to? And I think, foundationally, it comes down to being interested, right? Noticing what interests you, noticing what you're drawn to, and being interested in things and being interested in other people makes you interesting. It's a weird thing. But there you go. So social media takes that passion, right? And if you do a pretty good job of representing yourself online, it translates that into a visible medium. As Austin Kleon was saying, your work starts to exist online. You develop a personality on the internet. And this can backfire, or it can become oppressive, right? I have encountered the, the darker sides of this on, at times when I feel like the peppy, enthusiastic person that I am online is like 80% of my personality, but there's 20% of me that is not really camera ready for the internet at all times. And that's okay. I think a, a constant note in my career has been that every time I make a piece of work that I feel is too raw, if I draw something and I'm like, oh, this is it, you've crossed the boundary, this is too much, nobody wants to hear about this, you've gone and bared your guts and they're just gonna spit on you, I put that work up and that's the stuff that does the best. That's the stuff that people respond to the most vehemently and joyously and vociferously and other big words that mean happy things as well. Vociferous isn't necessarily a positive term, but they get a lot of reaction. And the times that I am willing to come forward and say, man, it turns out I'm not a one note human being. I'm not happy and excited all the time. People understand that. And those are the times when I feel like I really understand that I have crafted a community of people, not just an angry mob of hungry fans who feel entitled to my time and my attention and my output. And the, the engine that I think the internet runs on, which I'll talk about down the line, is this kind of exchange of giving, where I'm giving my work to my audience and they in return are giving me their support as a whole person. Whether that means supporting me financially on Patreon, buying my books at conventions, dropping me a note to say they hope I have a nice day, or like sending me chocolates when I reveal that I've been going through a rough emotional time, which has happened, which is crazy. That's crazy. I love you, Jacob. Nice man. Uh, so being visible allows you to attract people who are into what you do. If you are, like me, super into boats, it's kind of a niche market. I wouldn't have gone into comics saying like, you know what this industry needs? 
is some comics about 18th century tall ship sailing. That is a clear gap that is missing. But what has ended up happening is that now I am the only person who does this thing. Just like Mr. Salamander is the only guy who makes comics about salamanders. So anytime somebody needs a comic made about a boat, they call me, which is great. I have gotten to go sailing on the last wooden whaling ship in the world. Because of this job, I am going out to the East Coast again this year to work with a bunch of teenagers on a sail training vessel. I got a contact from one of my Kickstarter backers who works on an oceanographic research vessel who wanted me to come out and make some like science boat comics. Like, fuck yeah, I'll we'll go do that. That sounds great. The point that I'm making is that if you're interested in specific things, if you become a whole person who isn't just like recursively involved in comics or animation or art or whatever and is like constantly, you know, weaveling in on oneself, uh, becoming really obsessed with just the medium or the industry or the whatever. Develop your other passions. Be interested in things outside the medium that you're working in. Because I feel like as creators, we tend to stand out when we're capable of traversing those boundaries. And we're capable of stepping into other roles and saying like, hey, I'm the only cartoonist at this tall ship festival. And that makes me immediately more interesting and attractive than I am one of 500 cartoonists at this enormous convention. There's a time and a place for both those, but I think putting yourself out there means that people will either be attracted to the thing that you do because they've never seen it done before and they're like, oh my god, anything from I love the way you draw hands to like, I've been waiting all my life for 18th century boat comics. Yes. <laughs> those are all possible. But there's also the kind of attraction that happens where people are just like, wow, you're, a, you're an interesting person, right? That, that first thing again, be interested in stuff. People like that. I've had a lot of people who, I, I asked them why they backed my Kickstarter and said, you know, you honestly just seem like you care a lot about what you do. And you have a passionate project that you're like dumping all of your energy into in a really constructive and inspiring way. I don't have that in my life right now. So giving you money to help make that happen is the best that I can do. And that's pretty magical. It's still magical to me that I have funded creative projects through the internet. That's bananas. And then the people who are attracted to what you do, they become part of your tribe, right? They are your shipmates, if we're going to run with this metaphor of things being like a boat. And if people are your shipmates, then they are going to be what uh, Kevin Kelly referred to as true fans in an essay that he published in like 2008, so it's been a minute. And we read this essay for class because Kevin Kelly's supposition was that as an independent creator, you don't need Beyonce levels of fame to make it as an artist. You need probably about a thousand true fans. A true fan being somebody who buys, you know, the book, the t-shirt, the hat, they'll drive two hours to see you read at a bookstore. Like, they're, they're the people who are in it to win it. And then he published a follow-up article somewhat later being like, this sounded really inspiring when I put it out, but I haven't actually found any evidence that it works. <laughs> Which sucks because I read that essay and was like, yeah, I love this, this sounds great. And I didn't actually read the follow-up. I bookmarked the essay, and then when I was researching it for the class, I found the follow-up and was like, oh, hmm. wait a minute, then what am I doing? Because like, I'm, I'm kind of making it. And I don't have a thousand true fans yet, but I was able to muster 1,300 people who were willing to back that Kickstarter. And that's, even if all of those aren't true fans who will follow me from that book to every other project, those numbers are a lot better than the 300 people who supported me in my first Kickstarter three years earlier. So my... My belief about this is that when Patreon came along and hit the scene and when Kickstarter came along, this was 2008, right? Crowdfunding was not really a thing then. And I feel like what Kelly was getting at of saying, you know, this should work. We should be able to craft sustainable small business economies that will support independent artists through this kind of model is actually possible now thanks to crowdfunding and thanks to the internet and thanks to social media. So I'm, I'd be really curious to talk to him about what his assessment of that situation is now based on how things have changed in the last five to 10 years. They've changed a lot. We're gonna go really big picture for a minute here. Uh, what is art? I hate this question. <laughs> it's terrible. But I'm reading this book right now called The Gift by Lewis Hyde, which is another oldie but a goodie, but it's a great sort of historical examination of how the work of art functions in society. And he talks a lot about gift economies and we'll go into what that means. But stories and art, culture, all of these things that bind us together as human beings, they're social glue, right? They're a gift. They are something that you give to someone. And when somebody receives that story, if it touches them, then they experience a feeling of gratitude. And that feeling of gratitude, I think, can be tainted by capitalism. I'm not going to get very communist on you. I'm just going to point out the difference between capitalism and gift economies. Capitalism is saying, you can't read my comic until you buy the book. 
right? I'm going to keep this private until you buy it. This is in action in many, many parts of our culture, and it's not to say that you cannot have an emotional experience with a comic you've had to purchase from a store. But since we're talking about social media, the thing that allows me to do what I do, the thing that I've built my career on, I think revolves around a gift economy, which is a slightly different thing. It has the, the net result is the same, but I think how we get there is a little bit different. I put things on the internet, not just finished comics, but process shots, right? I post something every day of like, here's my drawing board, here's what I'm working on, here are my students being amazing, this is what I'm excited about, here's what I'm reading right now, blah, 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 whatever. And if people encounter that and they enjoy it, I'm not asking them for anything in return yet. And it doesn't, it shouldn't feel like Right, in a relationship, if you end up having an argument with their, their partner, I told you I wasn't going to give you relationship advice, but let's just say <laughs> you end up having an argument with your partner, and it comes out that your partner has been keeping a tally of how many times you've done the dishes, and they're like, well, look, I'm just saying, I've done the dishes five times, and you've done them twice in the last week. And like, that doesn't feel good, right? Every time your partner's done the dishes, you want it to feel like, oh, what a nice thing, a gift that was given without expectation of return. And that is honestly how I feel about putting my work on the internet. Best case scenario, somebody reads it and buys my book. Second best case scenario, somebody reads it. Worst case scenario, I never put it on the internet, nobody reads it, and I die friendless and alone. <laughs> not that one. We're not going for that one. So the gift of my work turns into a gift of financial support from my fans, which if you look at it from the outside is like, that's exactly the same thing, right? You made a comic, eventually somebody paid you for the comic, it just takes longer, and that's inefficient you should just charge for the comic up front. But I argue that giving gifts allows for greater mobility, right? Your gift can go to, your art can go to a viewer and they may choose to buy your book, or it may go to a viewer and the viewer may say, oh wow, this really touched me. I don't have any money, but I know somebody who runs an oceanographic research vessel. I will forward this comic to them. And if they like it, they may hire you for a job. Most of my work happens this way. Every time I do a panel on freelancing and people ask me, where do you get jobs? It all has to do with this. And gift just doesn't have to, it doesn't just have to mean artwork. It can be the gift of your attention, your excitement, your presence, your care. These are all things that I think contribute to having a thriving career. I love this quote from Cory Doctorow, who some of you may know as the co-editor of Boing Boing, which is a really big internet cool stuff website. And he's written a bunch of different books. All of them are, are really great. Uh, he's a big proponent of copyright law reform and sort of free market stuff. And this quote has to do with the fact that he has put all of his books that he has written, they are available for purchase in stores, but he's put them online for people to download for free from his website. And tons of people have downloaded them, right? And he says, most people who download my book don't end up buying it, but they wouldn't have bought it in any event. So I haven't lost any sales, I have just won an audience. And I think that last clause is kind of where it's at, right? You're winning an audience. I think for the last three years of my career, I haven't been asking my audience for a lot financially. Occasionally I put out a new mini comic that's three bucks and some people buy that and that makes me feel nice. And I go to conventions and I sell things that are three to 10 bucks and people buy those and I feel nice. And then the time comes along where I need to raise $15,000 to publish a proper book with a spine and an ISBN code and the whole thing. And I come to my audience and I say, hey guys, I need you now. I can't haul this line by myself. I need a team of people. And that team like fucking slam dunks through the goal in the first day and you're left shaking on this roller coaster like, oh my God, this is just money they're giving me. Why are they giving me money? And it seems really weird to me. It seemed really weird at the time that I couldn't wrap my head around like where all of this support was coming from until I recognized that for the past three years I had been busting my ass putting myself out there and showing people that my work existed and that I was excited to be doing it and that I wanted to share that with them. And it came back to me in space. And I'm not the only person who has this story by a long shot. So it's something to think about. The more of my work that I give away for free, the better I do. That being said, this does not apply to client work. Your client should pay you for the work that you're doing. Your craft is worth money, unless you're doing it for yourself, in which case you're kind of working on spec for yourself, which is very confusing. I'm hoping that by the time I die, it will have all shaken out and I'll get more than like three bucks an hour for what I do. Mm -hmm. on my own time. But if you're freelancing and you're working for a commercial client, you should be charging for your work. Let's just be clear. Here is a theory that I've come up with about the internet. We're probably going to stop talking fairly soon, but this was interesting to codify. I don't know how it ties into the talk. But I think the internet, right, is an engine for you saying, okay, I'm here every time you tweet or put up a website or whatever. And two things happen as a result of the internet. The first thing is social resonance. The second thing is social awareness. 
social resonance is the thing where you see something and it makes you feel less alone, right? It's either you see a comic and it's something you've known all along but have been dying to see reflected in media that makes it easy to understand. Maybe it's a comic about uh, your time on tall ships and people have always, like maybe, I've had contacts from people who grew up sailing on tall ships and they feel like the comic really captures their experience and they're really excited because they finally get an opportunity to see themselves reflected in the media that they consume. And I think that resonance, that reflection is crucial. It's why representation and diversity is really fucking important in the media that we make and it's something we should all be aware of. But then the other thing that happens is social awareness, which is the exposure to new voices, which is the opposite of that thing, where, kind of the opposite, you are being exposed to somebody who is very clearly also a human being, but who may have completely different circumstances or backgrounds or considerations from you. And I have become a far more, a better rounded person, I think, for having been on the internet and listening to what people have to say on the internet. And there are huge swaths of the internet that one should probably not listen to. We harped in our class a little bit about don't read the comments. There are cesspools of humanity on the internet. But there are also lots of people making really good work. And I think looking to the work that is outside of your comfort zone gives you exposure to voices that you may not have encountered in your day-to-day -day experience, in your life. If you grew up in a particularly non-racially diverse environment, or you grew up in a particular socioeconomic bracket, and being on the internet, while still limiting, right, the people who are on the internet are admittedly a smaller percentage of the world's population, but out of that percentage, you're still going to get a huge array of voices outside of what you're used to. And through both of these things, I think, we get social change. Right? We get the answer to Kevin Kelly's question of how is it that it should be possible for people to make a living on the internet, but we don't know how they can. Then crowdfunding comes along and things start to change. Or then Twitter comes along and news reporting starts to change because news anchors can have their words contradicted in real time by people who are on the ground at a conflict reporting on it. Obviously there is great opportunity for misinformation to spread like wildfire, but this is just a really, this is a very big picture thing and it doesn't necessarily have to do with marketing yourself or your art, but I've been thinking a lot this week about what the internet does and how it does it. So I thought I would throw that in there for you guys to enjoy. This is a question by Rainer, uh, a question, a question, a quote by Rainer Maria Rilke that I really love. He says, live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. And I think this is a really good thing to remember when you're on social media and you feel like you have to present your perfect best self who has it all figured out at every step of the way. And I think the more powerful thing to say is, I'm here and I'm excited to be here and I have no idea what I'm doing. And that resonates with far more people than being the person who pretends to have all the answers. Here's a story about my dad. He went to Cambridge University in England. My, both of my parents are from the UK. And his father wanted him to go into insurance or advertising or law or something that he didn't really want to go into. And his father had worked very hard to get him into Cambridge, to get him into this degree. And my dad decided while he was an undergraduate that he wanted to be an actor. And he ended up joining the Theatrical Society at Cambridge. He left, having graduated, and went to the States to be in a play. And his father was furious with him. And this began an enormous schism between the two of them, where they fought for ages and ages, feeling like his dad never understood him. My father went off and had this relatively successful career doing this thing that he was really excited about. But he and his dad never got on because of it. And it wasn't until his father was dying, lying in a hospital bed, that they reconciled, and his dad said to him, I'm sorry for the way that I treated you all of those years. I was jealous that you had the courage to go out and pursue the thing that you cared about. And every time I think about that story, A, I get really pissed at the repressiveness of British culture emotionally, and B, I just wish he could have said that sooner. I wish he could have admitted that he was scared, or that he didn't know what he was doing, or that he felt frustrated or jealous earlier. And at the times when I think the internet is most powerful, I think it allows us to see those aspects of other people that make them fallible and human. And they allow us windows into each other's lives and windows into each other's realities. And the stories that we tell, be they autobiographical or fictional, 
hopefully we'll have that shred of ourselves, right? That courage that it takes to put yourself out there. And that will touch something in somebody else and maybe give them the opportunity to say, I was jealous, I'm sorry, or I'm scared, I don't know what I'm doing. So you're enough, just the way you are right now in the work that you're doing. I know you are in an institution that pushes you to do really excellent work, which I think is amazing. And I think you should latch onto that. I'm really jealous that I never got to go to art school. Seeing the opportunities that you guys have here it is an amazing, amazing thing. But I think it's also valuable to remember, as we've talked about in class this week, it's just comics. It's also fucking comics! Like, oh my god, it's everything! But it's also just comics. <laughs> this is the weird yin-yang of existence that we, have to, uh, that we have to deal with in our lives to figure out how to move with grace, how to give ourselves permission to move with the tides and the weather and to let our boat go where it needs to go on the days when it just doesn't want to go where we want it to go. And also to realize that that ship is your life, right? And you need your crew to sail it, and it is the only line of defense between you and an enormous and inhospitable ocean. And all you have is each other. So, that's it. Here are things that you can do to keep in touch with me. These are all the places that I'm at on the internet. And uh, we'll take like a five minute break and then do some questions. So bye for now. Thank you guys. Thank you.